Welcome to the Conversations with Kelly show. And it's an amazing Friday. There's been lots of, you know, great things happening. And uh, I, I'm just so excited about having the amazing Kiki Planet on. I've heard some amazing, cool things about her. <laughs> And uh, I know she's so full of energy, so I'm really looking forward to, to chatting with her. But let me just give you a little bit of information about why I wanted to do this show. I really believe that the biggest reason some people aren't successful in their life is because they are being destructive. And people ask me, what do you mean by destructive? And what I mean is... They are doing certain things in their lives. They have certain behaviors that are stopping them from being who they should be. Some people are alcoholics. Some people are, you know, they, they're doing drugs or they're procrastinating or they're making bad decisions and they're not allowing themselves to go forward. And I, when I had to look back at my life and I was looking at some of the decisions I was making, I realized that I was secretly self-sabotaging myself and not allowing myself to grow as high as I wanted to grow. And when I talked to my coach about it and said, why? Why am I playing too small? Because so many people say to me, Kelly, you're playing too small. You need to play big. And I kept saying, but I'm trying. How do I play big? And what it boiled down to was that I was doing some things that were being destructive in my life that weren't allowing me to move forward. In fact, they were causing more chaos in my life and it was stopping me from getting where I wanted to go. So when I was able to stop all that destruction and the chaos and bring some more order to my life, that's when things started to shift and I started noticing that I was having even more success in my life, which was awesome. So I'm really excited that Kiki has decided to join us on a Friday evening and if you want, you're welcome to bring some wine. So I didn't have any wine, so I had to make myself a crazy fruity drink, and now I'm going to have seeds in my teeth, and it's probably going to be kind of crazy, but <laughs> I, I figure that it's a Friday night. We all deserve to wind down and just kind of relax. So, Kiki, I've got a question for you. Okay. You know what it's all about. This is all about being destructive and, you know, and then shifting and becoming powerful. So yeah. I want to know... When you looked, was there ever a time when you looked in the mirror and you just did not like yourself? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, and um, it, it was, I, I've always been a person of excesses. That was my shield from the rest of the world. And you, alcohol, uh, relationships, sex for a time, dieting. I've always been a person of almost obsessive excesses. And when I finally had that that epiphany, that light bulb moment when I, I looked in the mirror and realized that everything, the, the whirlwind that was constantly around me, the storm I was living in the center of was all of my own doing, that changed a great deal for me from that moment forward. And for me it really was one of those epiphany moments. I know for other people it's more of a slow gradual growth, but I definitely had those times when I looked in the mirror and didn't like who I saw. And it wasn't because of this. It wasn't because of my physicality. It was because no matter what I did with this shell, the nut inside the shell was exactly the same. And I had to deal with uh, the bad nut and stop worrying about the shell. And really, um, that was one of the things that I really enjoy about working with my coach is that she keeps telling me to dig deeper. And so what I hear you saying is that, yeah, we can look in the mirror, and we're still mm -hmm. seeing that same body and that same, you know, that same physicality. But when we really dig into our hearts and our soul, that's where the pain is. And that's right. where the self-destruction is. It's not on the outside of our bodies. It's, it's on the inside. That's very true. And I think for some of us, and it was for me, uh, I went through a stage where my physicality was my, my ultimate shield. It, shield me, it shielded me from relationships. Now, it, when I was younger and heavier... It was something I could blame a lack of relationships with men on. Then when I got very thin and was getting a lot of male attention, I could blame my lack of close female friendships on my physicality. I never had to take responsibility for who I was because I always had this shield that kept people away and then I could blame it on my shield. So it wasn't until I realized that it's got nothing to do with what I look like on, on the outside. It's, it's how I treat people. 
it's very importantly how I treat myself, whether or not I have respect for me. That's what changes the course and even the daily moments of my life. Isn't, isn't that true? That's uh, one of the things that I've been working on is about value. Mm -hmm. And, you know, value and respect. And, you know, just like you, there were things that I was doing that were showing that I wasn't respecting me. And if yeah. I wasn't going to respect me, how is somebody else going to respect me? That's very right. true. Did, did you find, because I went through this stage, did you find that part of that process, too, was no longer allowing other people to define you and no longer apologizing for who you were? That, for me, was a huge process. When I stopped apologizing for who I am, when I stopped apologizing for being strong, when I stopped apologizing for being smart, for being opinionated, for being who I am, then things really started to change. Did absolutely. You oh, absolutely, because I allowed other people's opinions to make me feel whether I felt I was going to be beautiful or not. Mm -hmm. or whether I was going to be smart enough or not, or whether I was going to be a good enough speaker, or whether I would be a, a good enough writer. And it was like when, you know, a couple of years ago, people were saying authentic, authentic, authentic. And it was like, mm -hmm. you know what? I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to yeah. put on Facebook <laughs> what makes me feel happy. You know, yeah. and, if, and if people don't laugh and they don't think it's good, oh, well. But to yeah. me, it's, it's all about letting go and being... Um, and stop being so scared of what other people are going to think of you. Right, and I've, I've really found that when I, on the few occasions that I've submitted to that, submitted to uh, other people not liking who I am, I lose respect for myself. And when I, when I walk away from my computer or when I walk away from a conversation, that person just goes on with their life. But I'm the one who has to live with me. I'm the one who has to face me in the mirror. And if I lose respect for myself by, by backing down in those moments, by apologizing for who I am or minimizing who I am, I'm the only loser there. I've not pleased them because they weren't, they weren't looking to be pleased by me in that moment anyways. They were only looking to attack me. Well, and the other thing is, really, you are being destructive by mm -hmm. allowing other people's opinions to affect you. That's very true. Right? It is. When all you can think about is what other people think of you, that is being destructive to your own self-esteem. Yes. Okay. So, this has been a very interesting conversation because I can really relate to what you're saying because <laughs> I know with you, I mean, you are very opinionated. And, you know, and I, I watch your Facebook statuses and I have to admit, because I'm not into politics, a lot of it I don't, <laughs> I don't understand, you know. But I totally admire your bravery, you know, in being able to be that authentic and just put it out there. And, you know, and, and to a point I believe I'm the same way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. in a different way. And, and that's something that, you know, I remember you commenting on one of my statuses one, one time. And, you know, and we were both, you know, um, commending each other on how, it's so awesome that we're standing up for what we believe in. Yes. Yeah, and you know, one of the things I, I try to remind people is that I quite often, ex I present extremes, on, especially on my Facebook page. I've moved a lot of that more controversial debating style over to Facebook and taken it off Twitter because it just doesn't do well on Twitter. But a lot of times when I present something on Facebook, my my real focus is on getting people to stand up for what they believe in. Say it. Don't sit there silently. I've said something that I know has pushed some buttons in you. I've said something you so strongly disagree with. Tell me because I will listen to you. And once you've said that, your respect for yourself grows. And then we can all converse here and we can relate to each other and we can learn from each other. It always excites me when, when I get an email or a private message from someone who's played on my Facebook page for a while and who says to me, you gave me the courage to say something I would have never said before because I was too afraid to say it. Those are the moments that make every debate, every troll, every <laughs> <online pastor. laughs> the tro Don't feed the trolls. Don't feed the trolls. But at that moment, it's all worth it because as a result of that moment, Someone, even if just for that moment, they found their voice. And when they tell me that, I would have never said that anywhere else. I, 
everything is worth it then. Like this is why I do it. Because people will come here and say what they need to say that they can't say anywhere else right now. Because but nobody tomorrow, else will listen to them, right? Yeah. But tomorrow they, feel they, they might, don't have a voice. And tomorrow they might find they've grown the brass ovaries overnight to say it when they want to. <laughs> and that's great. That's what I hope a lot of people find on, on my Facebook page and sometimes in my Twitter profile. Just say it. Be kind. Well, and, and I'll never forget that one time I created some controversy on my page. And um, do you remember when Jan Arden decided to get naked for those poses, for those pictures? Yeah. Yes. And I didn't know the whole story. So all I saw on the internet was someone said that Jan Arden posed nude for um, Brian Adams you know, <laughs> to, to promote this this book or tour that she was doing. I don't remember what it was. Anyways, I was like, what the F is she doing posing <laughs> naked? And, I, and, and it infuriated me because mm -hmm. I was like, I just, I'm tired of women thinking that they need to get naked in order to make a statement. Right. So all these people were like, well, Kelly, I guess you're really not that comfortable with your body then, are you? And how dare you not allow a woman some freedom of expression? And all these people were just like slamming on me about it. And, and maybe it's because of my scars. I mean, my, my body is 75% covered in scars. And I, I, I'm just tired of women thinking they have to, you know, get naked to, you know, to yeah, prove and something. And I do, I think there's a difference between, um, you know, the women who purposely leak their sex videos or pose, pose nude in Playboy or, or now it's even on the cover of Cosmopolitan. And hey, that's their choice. As a feminist, that's their choice. Do what you're going to do, sisters. Power to you. But for me, uh, our bodies are just what carry us through this journey. And they shouldn't be all we're about. So I, I think it's wonderful women who have enough confidence to do that. And I'm hoping that at some point in time, I'll have the confidence to shed, you know, the Spanx and the 18-hour bra and the, <laughs> and the cashmere and take a picture of my body as it really is. Not to be sexual, but to say, this is how I look and I love me the way I look. These are my stretch marks. These are my breasts that have fed four babies, and I'm, I love this, this ship that is taking me on this journey. For that purpose, I would definitely do it. Um, I can, for me, what Jan Arden did was incredibly brave, just because what she's bearing, women like us don't have balls to bear <laughs> what Jan is bearing, Jan. And she's out there... I think when she does that, she's making a political statement too. Jan has always been a woman who fought that pop culture. She said in an interview once that uh, some American producer told her that if she lost 20 pounds, he could make her a big star. And Jan's response was, I guess I'm not going to be a big star then. And for me, that's like, sister, rock on. Rock on! I know. I'm all for that too, because yeah. I don't believe that we should have to change our bodies if we don't want to. No, and for her to to let Brian Adams of all people photograph her nude, I'm all about yeah. As long as you're doing it honestly, as long as as long as you're not doing the airbrushing and the slimifying, then then I'm all with you. I kind of take issue with the society and the culture that thinks that women have to to show their tatas in order to be successful in this world in order to garner any kind of media attention. So on that end of it, I entirely agree with you. To me, that's that's everything we fight against. You know? We say, you can't judge me on my shell, but I have really good boobs. So do you want to put them on the front of your magazine? Because like we can't have it both ways. Choose one or the other. <laughs> oh my gosh, you're so funny. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. You know, everybody's got some different opinions about it. And I think, you know, like what you're talking about, the picture. I mean, if that's something that you did for yourself and your husband, I get it. 
but but it doesn't have to be for the whole world. And my question to you is, do you yes. think that sometimes people are doing this kind of stuff just to get the media attention to skyrocket their career? Oh, absolutely. Right? I mean, what are, they, what, are, what are they calling? Um, I, I don't like to talk about celebrities, but that Kanye Kim thing now, are they Kim Ye or Con Kim or I don't even know what they are these days. But her entire career is built upon that. And now he's he's also become that. His entire career is on on saying scandalous things. I, this is this is what society does to men and women. And it's unfair to both of us equally. With women, they reduce us to our breasts and our hips and our face. They reduce us to this. And without this, society says we have no value. You you know what I'm talking about. This is what we face. Oh, right? I totally know. I mean, I we have no value. With men, they do it with money and power and the woman that's on their arm. So really, we're all victims of this sort of paradigm that really that reduces us to uh, initial first appearances, to uh, social status, to uh, impressions. We're all victims of it. So. I've, I've always been a big believer that it's something we fight with men, not separately with men. Men have to understand how this, how sex tapes hurt their daughters and their daughters' futures, how it hurts their sisters. Women have to understand how focusing on a man's success, his position, his sports car, his fame, how that hurts their sons, how it hurts their sons' futures. And how so, like you're saying, it, it destruction is what it's doing. Exactly. It's causing them to be destructive in their own lives, and it's setting a pattern so that it gets passed on from generation to generation. That's right, and it's something that we we need to work with our brothers on. Like I'm really into sister power. I always say that sister power, but sisters need brothers too, and we need to invite them into the conversation to invite them to share their pain because men have pain. Surprise, surprise, men have yep. pain as well. And if we invite them to share their pain with us and do so in a trusting and sincere way, not get them to share crap we're going to beat them up for later because, <laughs> ladies, <laughs> we, we can do that on occasion, but allow them an open and honest way to share their emotions. We find that we do have a shared pain and that this the destructive attitude of society and our culture affects all of us and it it most of all affects our sons and daughters and if we want things to be better for them then we have to start now leading the way that's and that's all we can do to make it better we're not going to change our generation Kelly you and I <laughs> come on I thought that. we were doing a good job <laughs> we're, hey, we're, we're working on it but you and I both know that at this point, the best we can do is change the minds of a certain portion of our generation and have that them pass that down exponentially. Exactly. They say the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. I like to think the hand that hits the keyboard rules the world. Well, yeah, <laughs> and it, it sounds like you've got some pretty incredible power on Twitter. <laughs> power, power? I don't know. I, I, I'm sure there's a lot of people who follow me just so they can face palm. Just say, oh, Kiki. Oh. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Again. There she goes. And, and they probably think you're just being destructive to yourself because you are perfectly bringing this drama into your life. I, I think a lot of them, yeah, they don't understand. I get a lot of that don't feed the trolls. And I try to respond to people with the comment that so... So what's worse, just blocking them out, not acknowledging them, not giving them a voice, or at least trying with a little bit of peace in my heart to engage them and possibly change minds a bit, which is worse. I don't want to be silenced. No one wants to be silenced. And I think a lot of people online who would appear to be trolls are coming from some very dark, lonely, hurtful places who've lived in a lot of destruction of, of their own. And maybe, just maybe, and I've actually had it happen with a few trolls who've ended up becoming my friends, maybe if you give them an ear, if you give them a moment, 
you find the humanity in them and they find the humanity in you and then there's just that minuscule little bit less destruction in the world well I'll tell you about a time when I didn't feed the troll because I totally under what, understand what you're saying you're putting yourself out there and doing what you're doing because you want to create some conversation and some healthy conversations and it really doesn't matter if they agree with you or not it's you want different perspectives which is awesome well I'll tell you about a time that it was destructive and I did a video response to um, a woman her name is Jennifer Livingston and she was told I don't know if you remember this story this was I think about a year ago and she was overweight and uh, a broadcast or no a newscaster Yes, and, I remember her. Right, okay. Yeah. And so this pers a person said that, you know, was bullying her, you know, and saying that she shouldn't be on TV because she was overweight. Mm -hmm. So anyways, she responded to that. And I also responded, but I did a video interview. I didn't just comment. I did a video interview, and I said, you know what, I, I totally get it, and I applaud you for going out there and doing being something different because mm -hmm. media thinks you have to have that perfect body you know and that perfect look in order to be on the media and I think that's pretty cool that you you know you did this and I talked about how I was labeled as the ugly Scarface girl when I was in grade 5 and I saw a picture uh, that was on my teacher's desk and it was a circle with eyes nose mouth and scribbles and then oh. it said Scarface okay and I said and I was telling them all about this so somebody put on a comment on that and said you are an effing C-U-N, no, effing liar, no, you oh, are an effing C-U-N-T, you're <laughs> lying, that didn't happen to you and but too bad you're just a big baby. So my immediate response... See, that's a true troll, that's a true troll. Yeah, and, and, and immediately I wanted to like fight back, I was like, ah. Oh, how come he called me a liar? He doesn't even know who I am. And, you know, yes, it did happen to me, and I know it. Why would I put this on if it didn't? And, and I was just, like, instantly into fight mode. And yeah. so I had to step back and look at it. And all of a sudden I got a text message from my friend that says, Kelly, do you know how special you are to me? And I was, like, instantly I sifted. Yeah. And I was able to go from being destructive to being powerful right in that moment and I, it was awesome because then I didn't say nothing to the guy because I thought <laughs> he just wants a fight yeah right? yeah and I, and I find quite often there's there's people online that I have to do that with that from from the get-go I know there's no amount of conversation I could have with this person this person is here for attention and one of the things I've learned and I've had some great um, great advisors when it comes to social media uh, Mac D Mail who is a, a fantastic local uh, personality, Jalen Nye, who is a, a dear friend, and I think she's with she's with Chorus Radio now. Oh, Jalen, yeah, I know Jalen. Jalen's yeah. my ginger sister. One of the things that they've taught me is that a lot of times, if you already have a bit of a following, if you have some notoriety, which you do, there are going to be these people who want to piggyback on that. Yeah. And, one of the things they pointed out to me is, you know, you have almost 12,000 followers on Twitter. So mm -hmm. that means if someone can get you riled up who's only got 80 followers and you end up in a public fight with that person, your 12,000 followers and now they're gonna know the name. Oh. But they also, it gives him a certain notoriety he doesn't deserve. So yep. people like that I've learned to immediately shut down. Now the other end of it, of course, and, and this is something I've shared a lot because I, I do think it's important that, that people know. Uh, my having a voice and my having a strong opinion and my refusal to back down has not come without a price. I've Absolutely. I, exactly. And that's what I mean. I mean yeah. I'm sure a lot of people say, why are you causing this drama in your life? I mean that is, can be a form of destruction. Yeah. And I, I think You've got to have a strong personality to handle that. You have to have skin like an alligator handbag, is what I always say. I've endured uh, death threats. I've endured threats to burn down my home. I've endured threats against my children, including my six-year-old daughter, from people who want to silence me, especially on specific political issues. 
So that's something that a lot of these trolls and, and other people don't see when they attack. They don't see that, you know, I'm, I'm not doing this just to waste time. There's a purpose to my madness. And it's to get those who, who want to make a change to speak out and to make the change. And yes, I pay a price for it. I don't get paid for what I do. I have no job. I'm a stay-at-home mom with a wonderful husband who supports everything I do. Uh, my little princess daughter. But I'm not paid by media. I'm a local philanthropist and I'm involved in charity. And yes, I pay the price for what I do. And I think it's very easy for people online, and this is exactly, it goes back to what you endured. It's very easy to dehumanize from behind this screen, and it's very easy to destroy. It's very easy to lash out at those we don't know. It's very easy to call names and cause hurt and inflict pain and create drama from behind here. What I try to do is definitely create uh, a forum for conversation, create heated exchange, but it's never my intention to create drama. Uh, right. Tamara Plant, you know Tamara Plant well. Tamara yes, Plant, I do know Tamara, for sure. Yeah. Of fierce, yes, we were both fierce nominees the same year. That's right, yeah. I, that was the year that I won the fierce woman of the year. Right. Yeah, that was the year I won nothing. Oh, but I'm not bitter. <laughs> well, I, you're more than welcome to, you know, apply again. I got, I, I got a nice certificate. It was lovely. But Tamara Plant has really been an inspiration for me when it comes to drama. <coughs> she uses the term, <coughs> excuse me, drama llamas. And she's very much separated herself from the drama online. And that inspired me to a certain extent. I saw quite often other people would tweet at her with the latest mommy blogger drama or the latest Twitter drama. And Tamara, in Tamara's way, would say, I just don't have the time for that. I got other stuff I'm doing. <laughs> but that inspired me that, you know, it's not about just putting a smile on your face and accepting all the crap that people dish out on you. It's just about saying, I don't have time for this. I have more important things going on here. Making that known, and then just disengaging from the drama. So from... From that sort of point of view, Tamara really inspired me by by doing that, and I think it's a lesson we can all learn from. There's a difference between online drama and online discourse or exchange, learning experiences. When it gets personal, that's drama, man. I don't. Well, what is, who's that singer who says, "No more drama in my life"? You know that song? <laughs> no, no more drama. I'm going with that <laughs> model from now on. Well, you know, and this is um, one of the th reasons that I'm loving the new program that I'm working on. I'm setting up an eight-week coaching program called You're More Than Enough. And it's all about going from destructive to being powerful. And one of the, the modules that I'm working on is called Stop the Head Drama. Yeah. And how a lot of times what we're doing is we're creating our own drama for no reason. And it just gets us in this vicious loop that we can't get out of. And then we're like, oh my gosh, why do I keep replaying that scene in my head over and over and over? And then you get madder and madder and madder. And then you're like, how am I going to get off this, you know, out of this loop so I can just move on? And so that's one of my, the purposes of my program is to help teach you how you can get off that loop and then yeah. shift so that you can start using your head for more powerful stuff instead yeah. of destructive stuff, instead of, you know, use it for good drama instead of like bad negative drama that's yeah. just bringing you down and, and Ab not abandon, getting you anywhere. Abandon all the self-created nonsense in, in your head. My dad said something to me once. He said to me, Cass, you've got to realize that half the time when you're reacting to something someone has said, you aren't taking into consideration that they have a whole life behind them. You're expecting them to understand you're a human, you have your own foibles, you have your own struggles and trials, but you don't recognize any of that about them. Everyone's got their own little motion picture going on in their head. Everyone interprets anything you say, anything you do, according to their own experience. 
and yet you expect them to accept everything you say and everything you do according to your experience, which places an undue burden on them and makes you entirely unsympathetic. And it also creates a little bit of a narcissistic drama where it's all about, <laughs> it's all about Kathleen. And I actually say that And to Kathleen's myself. opinions. And yes. everybody should agree with Kathleen's opinions, right? Exactly. And I I'm the same it. way. I think everybody should believe that Jan Arden shouldn't get naked. <laughs> 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 and she shouldn't, you know, show the well, world I, that we I, have to get naked in order to make a statement. And I for some reason, all these people didn't agree with me. They were, like, slamming me. I kind of believe we should stop treating Brian Adams like he's some sort of demigod, but that's just me. <laughs> hey, I had a crush on him. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, talking about crushes. Yes. You better reveal that crush you were telling me about earlier because yes. it's kind of a crazy one. <laughs> as much as I've moved away from my self-destructive behavior of my youth, and part of that self-destructive behavior was, of course, the troubled bad boy, I have a string of troubled bad boy relationships that uh, they, they pretty much make any Hollywood starlet look like an innocent. <laughs> I've retained one. And that is my, my love for Harry Potter's Snape, also known as Al Alan Rickman, I believe it's Rickman, Alan Rickman. Oh my I, gosh. He's so bad. He's so diabolical. <laughs> and it's the one little guilty pleasure when it comes to bad boys that I allow myself that, man, I, I told my husband that Snape is on my freebie list. He's on your top five? He's, he's on the freebie list, the laminated freebie list that, you know, my husband says, okay, if you meet any one of these people. Oh, yes. Okay, yeah. put out my, the offer. My ex-husband called it the top five. The yeah. top five, yeah, that's the good. Five. Like, top five, freebie list, that's a go. With no okay. questions There's Snape. no questions, eh? <laughs> yeah. Snape. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, you know, I, <laughs> I can't even, I, you know, to me, and again, like we were talking earlier, that destruction, he's <laughs> nasty. <laughs> What's he never going to happen? So it's okay. Because in the end, I married a very nice man who's very smart. He's a loving father. He's responsible. He's very unlike any of the destructive relationships I've had in the past. And he supports my sick, destructive fantasy about Snape from Harry Potter. That's pretty <laughs> relationship. Yeah, but you might run into the real one. The, the, the guy oh, that plays Snape. Gosh, fingers crossed. So what does that mean? Is he still <laughs> on the list? <laughs> no, I think or does he I have to be dressed like Snape? I think if I ever ran into him, the real Alan Rickman would end up being this entirely nice guy who spoke with a very proper and polite British accent that did nothing for me. It just wouldn't work anymore. And then you would just like, lose. Want, he would lose want, his magic. Yes, I want Snape. He's a fictional character. I don't want Alan Rickman with his... <laughs> he probably talks like Mr. Bean in real life, and that's just not hot. That's not going to work. Oh my gosh, you're so funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he's not hot. Okay. No. <laughs> not unless he's Snape, and then he's like smoking hot. He's almost George Clooney hot when he's bad. Oh my gosh. You never had crushes on you never had crushes on bad boys, Kelly. You didn't go through that stage. Um yeah, you know, I I do. I do. Yeah. But I can't pick one out in specific. I, I know that I didn't have any crushes on, you know, anybody on Harry Potter. I know that. I know. Isn't that sick? This is what... <laughs> I have four kids. I'm a... Four, I'm nearly 47 years old. I'm this close to 47. And what am I doing crushing on characters from Harry Potter? That I need <laughs> therapy for. Yeah. You know, you got to do something about that little bit of destruction thing you're going, <laughs> you got going on there. I think because you ended all the other destructive behaviors, you had to pull something in, you know. They say you end one addiction, you replace it with another. Okay, but see, that's a really good segue because this brings me to something else I wanted to ask you about. One of the things I discovered in my destructive past is that um, the destruction would become 
this overwhelming obsession in several areas of my life. It doesn't confine itself to just one thing. I, you mentioned earlier alcohol. There was a time in my life when I was very self-destructive with alcohol. But then when, when I got on top of that, then you just find something else destructive to replace it with. It's like the, the <laughs> self, you do though, but the self-destruction itself becomes like an, an illness, a form of addiction. So that I, for, I went from alcohol to then dieting and suffered with a severe eating disorder. For almost a decade of my life, I battled an eating disorder. When Which I got eating on disorder? Can you, can you tell us what eating disorder was? Sure. I, I was anorexic bulimic. Okay. So, and it, it was a horrible time in my life. It was a time in my life when I was absolutely the most attractive I've ever been here, but I was mm -hmm. so filled with self-hatred and so filled with self-disgust. I always say to women, women will say to me, you're so comfortable with your size which is that's sort of like an underhanded compliment you know there's like a little bit of an insult there too oh you like yourself even though you're a fat so good for you <laughs> there's, there's a little bit of you know but yeah. they say to me you're so comfortable with your size I always say to them you know am I really comfortable with being a 14, 16? probably not because it's not great for my health but this Kathleen likes this Kathleen. And size because you also know where you were before when you exactly. were being destructive. As far as you, you're now, you don't feel you're being destructive now because you don't have your eating disorder anymore. So that makes well, perfect because, sense to me. Because I'm more appreciative of other people now, too. Size 2, triple D boobs, Kathleen, she was a miserable, horrible person who didn't care about other people's feelings. And when you looked in the mirror, what did you see when you I, were that anorexic woman? I just hated her. And I lashed out at other people because of that self-hatred. But this Kathleen, this buxom kind of ballsy broad, this Kathleen likes herself. Yeah, and I'm not, ad I'm not advocating for ignoring your health. I want to make that very clear. But what I am advocating is for loving yourself enough to not let other people's opinions of how this is affect who you are because that's what makes us destructive a lot of times is when we allow other people's opinions of this to shape how we move through our own world. That's not good. I like size 14, 16 Kathleen. Size 2 Kathleen? Oh, that girl nobody, ain't nobody got time for that girl. I can <laughs> tell you that much. Well, and you know what, I found, like, when I was struggling with my beauty and how I felt and struggled, you know, with my scars, um, then I noticed everything more, but yeah. when I stopped caring about whether people thought I was beautiful, and, and I know the moment that it all happened, it was, and then all of a sudden, people tell me that when I walk in the room, I'm turning heads, and I don't even know that I am. But it's not because of what I look like, or I don't think it is. I think it's because I have this energy and this power that I walk with, you know, like yeah. the, the spirit that just comes naturally because I really don't care and if you, you think I'm ugly or beautiful or gorgeous or whatever you want to call me. Wait, you carry yourself with pride. You carry yourself with grace. You know, um, Maya Angelou... Do you know Maya Angelou, the poet? Her, her, yes, I do. Her poem, Phenomenal Woman, where she says, Pretty women wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. When I tell them my secret, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's in the glint of my eye, the sway of my hips, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman phenomenally. That poem, when you read it, it really encompasses all that. That it's not that about is. being fashionable. Law. It's about that walking is. into a room. I am a woman phenomenally. Here exactly. I am. And you know, and I've even been in the hot tub. And my um, when I was married, my husband would tell me he um, people would come up to him and say, "I can't believe she's in the in the swimming pool like that," because I was wearing a bathing suit. And because my scars were showing, mm -hmm. and I've had, um, he was really upset about it. And then there was another time I went to a garage sale, and a woman says to me, 
They couldn't do better than that. And I was like, oh, you know, I was the, the, devastated. The, that was my turning point. That was the story that was my turning point where I said, I'm not going to let some stranger take my power away. Exactly. My kids, my kids have never, or my family or friends have never said, Kel, we would love you more if you were scarred us. Never. You, one, of, one of the things I've come to realize is that people who actually engage in that sort of behavior, it's not you they have a problem with themselves. It's their own insecurities and something about you being in a hot tub with your scars and being okay with that, that threatens them. It points out to them their own stupid insecurities about the two pounds they might have gained having that roll with butter. About the, the, the fancier home they couldn't have or the designer swimsuit they, they didn't buy. It's about their own insecurities. It's not about you. Secure people, they don't look at other people and try to find their flaws so that they can feel better then. And we do a lot of that in this society. And I think that's one of the most destructive things that we do. We and women, oh, sisters, we are so bad for it. We think we can make ourselves better by pointing out someone else's insufficiencies or someone else's scars or someone else's thoughts. We do this to each other. But taking down a sister will never make one of us better. It takes us mm -hmm. all down. Every time you take down a sister with your cruelty, with your unkindness, with your judgment, you take every sister down and you take yourself down too. We become better by supporting each other. We become better by focusing on the glory of being strong women, on the glory of being confident women, on the glory of raising confident, strong female children, not by beating each other up. Absolutely. Other and that's something that I teach in my new program, You're More Than Enough, is that you don't get anywhere by gossiping about people. In that's fact, right. You know, if you badmouth people, eventually it could get back to you, and rumors are spread, and and you know, eventually they're just going to be mad at you. How yeah. about well, how about complimenting people and empowering them and making them feel great about themselves and what they're doing in their lives, and and recognizing those little things, and and that's one of the things I teach when I speak, when I you know teach with teenagers, or when I you know even my module. It's all about. If you want to cause more drama and more chaos in your life, then go ahead, gossip all you want. But if you want to create order in your life and you know become more powerful, be the bigger person who is out complimenting and empowering people exactly. and telling them great things. And no one, no one ever made themselves great by making anyone else less. You right. cannot be a better you by dragging down someone else. I wish more of us would get this message. If you rip apart someone else, you rip apart yourself. And no one looks at any woman who is bashing someone else and says, oh, well, she's obviously better than the woman she's bashing because look at all the flaws she's pointed out. No, it doesn't work that way. They look at you and they think, this is an insecure person who's having a moment of crisis because she doesn't feel good enough about herself that she can avoid bashing others. We've got to stop yeah. doing that to ourselves and to we each do. other. I, that's one of the things I've said quite often online is don't DM me gossiping about another sister because Kiki don't roll that way. Don't do it. <laughs> if, if I've got something to say, anyone who follows me knows I'm going to say it. I'll say it to your face. My male friends know it. My female friends know it. My family knows it. I don't need to do some gossipy DMs with women. If you don't have, and this, I hate the subtweets. Oh, subtweets and passive aggressive Facebook updates. And no, just say it. Because all you're doing is reinforcing that you don't have a voice and that's why you lash out at others. Just well, and. Is, I totally agree with you, and I even had a situation where I was hearing rumors about a friend of mine, and um, they were saying that she didn't do something, but she actually did do it. And when I confronted her about it, because I said, you know, I don't know if I believe this or not, and I confronted her, and I said, look, this is what I'm hearing through the grapevine, is this 
the truth or a lie. Mm -hmm. And she said, oh my gosh, is that really what people are saying about me? She said, that's not at all. So here people are spreading rumors that aren't even true. Yeah, yeah, and they do that, they do that out of the, the need to fill their own black holes, that sucking black hole that's in people that they can't fill. You know, I've, I've actually been luck, lucky enough to make some very, like, lifelong friendships online. Um, Zita Dubé Lockhart, who I'm sure you're familiar with, because, I mean, Zita knows everybody, and she's just a lovely broad. And Kasia Gavlak, <laughs> who's confessionality on Twitter. People follow confessionality. She doesn't tweet much, but she's a wonderful feminist. We've, I've become friends with both of them. And it's almost like this unspoken thing that anything anyone says to me about Zita or they say to me about Kasha, I just immediately chalk it up to BS. I don't even have to tell them about it. We don't have to discuss it. I just go, BS. And as soon as someone tries to talk to me about either of them, my immediate response is like, yeah, yeah, you know what, you're, you're preaching to the wrong birdie here, don't chirp at this bird. Because these are my friends and I don't talk about other women. Just shut it down. Can you exactly. imagine if, if every the drama. woman did that? If every woman did that, if any time a woman came to you and said, oh, well, I heard that Jenny Oso Long Extensions said this about you, can you imagine if we all went, nah? No, I don't want to hear it. I'm not in there. And you know, and that's exactly what I've been writing about in the module. I said, if you want to stop the drama, just don't participate in it. Yeah, and, but simple. don't listen to it. Don't be passive aggressive about don't. the drama either. You don't have to engage. You don't have to defend your friends. This is something I say to my female friends all the time. Do not defend me. It is not your responsibility to defend me. All I ask you to do is go, uh huh, uh huh. Nah, go find out on Twitter. <laughs> just do a little of this. Mm -mm -mm. That's all you have to do. But don't just do it for me. Do it for every woman. Anytime someone comes to you to go like this, beep, 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 about another woman, just go, ah, this broad don't roll that way. And I'll tell you what. On. There is something that men do better than women. And, you know, I've spoken at a lot of women's conferences, and I tell them, I said, you know what? You know how women get, if you get mad at people? Maybe you don't yes. do this anymore because you're pretty opinionated. But, you know, some women will just, like, they'll get mad at their friend, and then they won't talk to them for months. And then you'll ask them, is something wrong? And they'll say, no. But then they'll go tell all their other friends what they're really oh. pissed off with you about. And then you don't, you're not friends anymore for six months or a year or forever. Yeah, and you don't know what so, the hell happened. No, That's exactly. So, so here's the thing. We have to be more like men in, in one way, exactly. for sure. Yes. Men can go and get mad at their best friend, duke it out, yep. get all upset, they do a little this, eh? tell each other to F off, and then five minutes later, they're having a beer or they're having coffee and everything is forgotten yeah. about. And they leave, it, like, like women watch more hockey. Those guys you see duking it out in the game, they're buddies. They probably played on the same junior team. Oh, that was probably their 10th fight. And, and the, yeah. that's the thing. They'll, they won't even know they had the fight. And, and women need to be more like that because that yeah. is causing so much destruction it in is. our own lives. And it well, stops it, us. But it's not only our own lives, Kelly. It's destruction that is, it's like a virus. Because we get self-destructive and then we infect whoever will listen to us. Well, That's what we do. I get yeah, mad at you. And instead of just calling you up, and I mean, this is why I'm lucky to have a, a couple female friends who are like-minded people. But instead of just calling you up and saying, yo, Kelly, yo. <laughs> So, uh, what was up with that? The other day, like, you want to throw down now? What's up with that? Instead of doing that, you call me up and you go, Oh, Kathleen, we haven't spoken in a while. Something wrong. I'm like, No, I love you. And then I pick up the phone and say, Oh, my God, Kelly just called me. <laughs> she I totally wonder what she wanted. And then we spread it. It's like I know. It's a stupid virus. We, we do yeah. that to each other. We gotta stop doing that crap. Cause that I had my best friend that spreads, right? It is, and my friend did <laughs> that to me uh, one time. Uh, she got a promotion, 
and we worked at the same company. And so I said, oh, so now that you're a bigwig, you know, you're you know, too big to talk to me now, right? <laughs> and she goes, Kelly, that hurt my feelings. I can't believe you said that. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I, did, I didn't yeah. know it hurt her feelings. And so I apologized right there. And I was like, I, I totally meant it as a joke. But yet, yeah, you know, I have another friend. This, this actually just happened a few months ago, and her and I had an issue, and she was all upset with me, and, you know, I said, I'm sorry. I owned up to what I did. It was wrong, and then I apologized to her again, and she said, well, I'm sorry. I, I, you really hurt me, so I don't know if we can actually be friends. I'm like, oh, man, but you said <laughs> I'm sorry. A couple men, of times. Men are ridiculous. Men can, like, poke out each other's eyes. Stab out an internal organ on the ice, and afterwards they shake hands and they go, "Good game, bro." Oh, well, actually, she deleted me on Facebook too. So, women, we say one little thing to each other is like the freaking feminist apocalypse. Oh my God, I'm never talking to her again. This is what we do, <laughs> but we gotta stop doing this to us. You know, I sometimes wonder if it's part of our addiction to drama. We get we love drama, girls. Women love drama. It's simple. We do. We love drama. That's and we love we other people to have them. more drama than us. And that's why we love gossiping. Because I, I, it makes our life look not so bad. Because their life is better and they're making more wrong decisions than we are. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. That is it exactly. You summed it up perfectly. That's what it is. Because by focusing on the crap in other people's lives, we go, oh, my crap doesn't stink that much. Trust me. All our crap smells. <laughs> Everybody's poo poo. It's stinky. It's stinky. So, <laughs> point out how somebody else's poo poo stinks. It don't make yours stink any less. We all got the same smell. Just well, and what about, the one, what about the ones that call the kettle black? I, there's, I, you know, there's times when even for me, I walk away. And I mean, you know me from seeing my stuff online. I'm not a walk away kind of gal. I'm stake your claim and put up a barricade. But there's times <laughs> when even I just kind of like, no, no, no. We're going to pass through here quietly with our eyes averted. Don't make eye contact. Do not speak to the locals. Just keep moving. <laughs> so I have a question for you because we're kind of running out of time. We are. It's been it, such mad fun, though. I've loved this. I know, but, you know, it, it is a Friday night, and if you want to go a little longer, I'm okay with that. <laughs> So, you know, it, it, like I said, I, I just want to talk a little bit about my program. And if you've got time to talk for another 15 minutes, I would love to if you're I'm up here. for it. Okay. So um, here's the thing. I, you know, before I always promise that we're going to do an hour or so. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my offer and what I'm doing. Again, I just okay. want everybody to know about the, my new eight-week coaching program that I'm doing. You're more than enough because I am really – tired of women and men being so destructive to themselves and not achieving their ultimate goals that they want. And so each module is all about, you know, looking in the in the mirror and seeing that pain. And Kathleen, just like, or Kiki, just like you were talking about, you know, it's, it's not just picking out that stuff on the surface. It's about digging deep. Yeah. It's not about just what your body size is. It's about what's going on in your heart and your soul. What is that chaos that you're causing? And, and if you are an alcoholic, a lot of times you're spending too much money on alcohol, which could be spent in other things. Or, you know, and then you're ending up drunk, and then your family's upset with you because, you know, you're not capable of, you know, being a good mom or a good dad. And you, you feel like you're not getting successful enough because everybody's judging you because you're drunk all the time. And so... My whole program is all about let's, let's help you to stop that destruction. Let's help you to discover what that is so that you can start shifting and you can become more powerful. Yeah. My, um, I'm looking for you know, probably about 50 people who want to be a part of the program. And it's going to start in February. The, the regular price is $9.97. But for people who are watching our show, it's only four ninety seven, so it's going to be a special deal for you. So, and there's also some special bonus gifts, and um, there's some people who are donating, or they're going to gift 
books and coaching stuff. In fact, my coach, who I've been working with, who has like taken me like just incredible loops and bounds, has offered a 45-minute free coaching call if you wow. purchase this program. Yeah, and she is absolutely amazing. So I'm so excited that she's willing to offer this as a bonus because she's the kind of person that charges big bucks to yeah. you know to work with her. So I'm excited that she's you know believes in this program and she really wants to see people stop being destructive too because when you're destructive, it also means that you're devaluing yourself and your abilities and who you are and there is some incredible content in there like she has seen everything that I've been doing and she said Kelly like you know you're hitting you're hitting it on the head the head like it's so deep and it's so um, it, it explains the difference between you know valuing yourself because like for me I always thought value meant how much money I was making every hour and you know if I could you know, and, and if I was only making $10 an hour versus $5,000 an hour, it showed more value. But in my program, I'm able to show you where you have more value, and it's not on how much money you make. It's based on service that you give, and I'm able to pick out or different situations. This, right? Or on this. Your value is Exactly. Isn't it? Your so value you're... isn't that. I actually have a challenge to you because we're getting really close to 8 o'clock. So I have a challenge to you that fits in with that. Here's my challenge to you. Okay. What I would like you to do on my behalf is find a young woman who I think you would really benefit from your program but okay. who could not normally afford to attend your program. Okay. And I will sponsor her for your early bird fee, your 497 fee. I'll pay for oh, that. That would you, be awesome. You find the young woman who who you think could most benefit from this program, who could not normally to. afford to, and I'll sponsor her. And okay. I'll send her. Thank you. Okay. I totally so appreciate that. So let's okay. put. Our, we're running out of time. So let's put a fist like this. Can you fist bump your screen? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much. I am totally, I totally love the idea, and I would love to find somebody, or, or if you know of somebody that you would like, you know, to be involved in the program, by yeah. all means. And it can, and it can be, you know, a young adult, someone that we really believe that needs, you know, to stop yeah. being sort of self-destructive. Well, and for me, it's kind of like, I want to save that young girl that I was, <laughs> a little bit. From you know what? Through a little bit of what I went through, you know, save her a couple years. So you find yeah. one girl, I'll sponsor her, her butt that will appreciate it for years to come. So I would that, love that. I would okay. love that. Thank I you. love I, this, Kelly. My gosh, we had so much fun. I know, and I love how vulnerable you were. That to <laughs> me is what it's all about, you know. It's, it's all about helping people understand that we are all real people with yes. real feeling who are doing things that we don't even realize. You know, I mean, you probably didn't even realize when you were, you know, drinking a lot that it was causing all this chaos. I you know? didn't back then. No, I didn't. No. You know, and, and even the anorexic. How do, how do you know that that's causing chaos in your life? And even no. some of the things I was doing in my life, it was like, really, what? You know, this is crazy. Yeah. And, um, Sometimes it takes someone with an outside opinion to say, Kelly, do you really realize what you're doing? Yeah. yeah. And sometimes what it takes is love and self-love, too. And Absolutely. When we, get to, when we get to that moment where we love ourselves, nothing's bringing us down. Nothing's exactly. Down. And that's just it. And that's why so many people say to me, Kelly, how are you able to walk out the door with those scars on your body? How are you able to, like, go to Africa walk down the streets with five million black people who are all staring at you and you're wearing a sleeveless dress and they see all your scars, how are you able to do that? You know what my response to them would be? How are you able know. to sit on your ass on your sofa watching TV and doing nothing with your life when you haven't had to face one day of what I face? Don't ask me how I go out like this. Because I'm asking you how the heck you don't go out and do something when you've got nothing holding you back. 
because that's really the question. It's not how do you do what you do, it's how do they not do anything. Isn't that the truth? And I love that because it's just so true because I am so frustrated with people who have dreams in their lives and won't follow them. Fear. Right? And, and, and they, yeah, their fear, you know, and even if they're yeah. just little steps. Like, I just really believe that people have to find ways to, to, to manifest those dreams in their lives. And yeah. life to me is all about living. That's, that's why we're on this planet. We're not on this planet to cause all this destruction to ourselves. We're on this planet because we are meant to have yeah. our dreams. I always say to people, and I think you can identify with this, people will say to me, you're brave. And I always say to them, I got nothing to be brave about. I'm a middle class white woman in Canada. I got nothing to be brave about. I'm honest. Bravery is not required of me. Because I, I was given the second easiest game setting in the video game of life. There's white male middle class. There's white kiki middle class. This isn't about bravery. For me, in a lot of ways, this is about penance. This is not only my penance for the, the despicable person I once was, but it's my penance for having it so easy. So don't tell me I'm brave, because what I'm doing is just what all of us should be doing. Don't well, tell know. Kelly, don't tell Kelly, how can you go outside? Instead, you should be saying, how can I be sitting here doing nothing when Kelly's doing all that she's doing? That well, and, and that's the whole thing. I think it's just hilarious. I mean, when people say to me, you know, I can't believe you go outside. I'm like, well, what choice do I have? Yeah. yeah. Seriously, I got burnt when I was two years old. What choice did I have? In yeah. my world, my family did not let me quit. Here's the thing. My family didn't see my scars. So... They didn't see that I had scars on my body anymore. So to them, I was just a normal, everyday kid who was, you know, yeah, I had to face some adversity, sir. I had to face some teasing and some staring and all that stuff. But I just felt I deserved life just as much as anybody else. Which you do. This you has know? been great, but I got a hot day with my husband and my kid. Yes, you have to go and hang out with them. I love this so much. Well, I and I love that you're on the show. Like, especially being a Friday night, I totally appreciate that you and your family, awesome. you know, give up and this time. And I think we us. should totally do this. Like, we don't even have to do it on air. We'll just Skype each other now and crap. It'll be ridiculous. Okay, we will have fun with that. Absolutely. I'm up for it. I've got lots of time coming up. So let, let's get, you know, let's do it. And you find that girl for me so I can sponsor her. I will. I'm gonna hey, do yes, something. Yes. You know what? I'm gonna do something on Facebook. I'm gonna do Me like too. a contest or something. And I'll share it. And I yes. love this tonight, Kelly. Thank you so much. See You're you. very welcome. Stay okay, take awesome. care. Take care. Keep in touch. Bye. Bye bye.